Hello everyone. Welcome to Chillopedia uh, live lesson broadcast. Uh, so good to see you. Week went by so quickly and now we are to continue working on the famous prelude from G major suite number no. 1 by Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, today we will warm up with uh, D major scale and uh, we will start working on the new bow stroke, staccato. That's one of the most confusing bow strokes, so we will just learn uh, basics of that. Mainly, we will learn what to avoid. In other words, we'll try to avoid making basic mistakes, and that will really help us uh, to, uh, to master this bow stroke in the future. While uh, you are still tuning in, uh, we will play D major scale, one note per bow. I will play three octave scale. But of course, you might not be ready yet to play such a long scale, so uh, you can then work on a part of that. Uh, one octave starting from the low D on the C string, or from just a open D using a uh, top two strings. And as always, uh, please uh, feel free to comment, to ask your questions, to uh, let me know anything about your life, especially your life as a cellist, uh, and uh, uh, greet other people and let us know which country you are from. Okay, uh, D major, uh, one note per bow, as always, no matter when you start, uh, early in the morning, in the afternoon, probably after lunch, or in the evening, you have to make sure that your body is ready. That means so uh, you make a quick uh, kind of tune up. You're checking if you uh, got rid of all excessive uh, tensions. You know, we uh, in our life sometimes we stressed out about certain things, and then we start playing, and all that stress uh, makes us to be extra tense. We all also very often forget about just uh, breathing, so letting our body to have good time. We we uh, we tense up, so you have to uh, try to get rid of all of that right before you start practicing. Okay, uh, D major one uh, note per bow. <laughs> I feel a little bit more relaxed, although uh, it's uh, morning here, and uh, and I don't feel that I do my best, uh, you know, preparing my body. But uh, you know, that's what is expected. Uh, our bodies are stubborn. 
they are not designed to play uh, to play musical instruments uh, so we need uh, we need uh, to really to work uh, hard to concentrate to uh, to do a good job about this and uh, thank you for tuning in uh, I see Ernesto good friend of Chalopedia is here and um, uh, and uh, I'm sure that more people are joining now okay uh, so uh, now I hope uh, I hope you guys got a chance to watch my recent video about uh, different uh, problems with body with uh, like you know when uh, when we have sore neck uh, sore uh, right hand thumb uh, back uh, shoulder uh, it will be really interesting to uh, to get more feedback uh, from you. I already read so many stories, different stories of cellist overcoming those obstacles, and it really helps uh, uh, helps uh, to me to to see different perspective on that. And uh, and uh, look, uh, it's just my experience, uh, and I'm mainly uh, mainly uh, dealing with uh, feedback from. Uh, my students from my previous experience teaching adult uh, students so I'll be honest with you so far I didn't have significant issues uh, uh, you know I'm talking about but I tried different things to uh, help my students and I saw that very often that worked so all those little advices I'm sharing in my latest video that might uh, help you if you have this kind of pain and also that might help you to prevent uh, this kind of uh, pain to happen which is uh, very uh, valuable uh, for every uh, every cellist because we we want to keep uh, keep playing our skill is growing and it's really unfortunate when uh, when some problem with the body uh, makes us to stop uh, to stop playing Okay, uh, now, uh, now if you are fairly new to cello, uh, uh, the uh, third octave uh, might be somewhat intimidating. But let me just in case um, uh, go over, uh, over that. You might be able to do it or at least uh, you will get the first even visual experience about that. And later on you will be less intimidating trying to uh, make those uh, shifts uh, to higher position. So uh, the harder the shift is, the most important uh, is actually not to think about precision right away, but uh, think about how you make this shift. Uh, usually our instinct is uh, to do the same, uh, say if you would uh, have to jump uh, down, I don't know, 20 feet. Uh, the, in, in, you know, you know, we uh, we tense up, we hesitate to to the last uh, last moment, and hopefully we will not have to do that. But if we do, we hesitate, and then and then and then we jump, and uh, and our body is under a lot of stress, and uh, that's actually quite uh, quite quite opposite. So you are making a shift. Uh, you have to first of all to watch how you make it that means that you have to uh, not to think about just two dots like you know beginning of the shift and uh, the end of that but you have to think about the process how you are making the shift so going to the high uh, to high position uh, and uh, you uh, you have to think uh, strategically one uh, step ahead for instance And what uh, do you do uh, to uh, to make a shift to G? You are not only uh, sliding on the fingerboard, but you will also need uh, to change your elbow position. Now, uh, not just lift the elbow for the sake of doing that. Uh, for instance, if you if you make it like this, uh, you will make things even worse. So you have to think, okay, uh, okay, look, uh, my wrist will uh, be in a different position but I still want to maintain this nice curved uh, relaxed uh, position of the left hand uh, you can even do it without cello you know keep your left hand like this and then do it this way 
So you see the difference, uh, the difference between this and that. This is, uh, this is very tense position. Right away, I feel strain in those muscles here. I feel strain in those muscles. And in a heat of performance or practicing, you might not even notice that. But that for sure uh, will uh, affect, you know, uh, well-being, health of your, uh, of your left hand. And arm. So, uh, so you have to make sure that you actually very careful of the change in uh, change in the elbow position. You are not doing it too much. And well, my usual mantra, my uh, usual motto: do it slowly. But of course, uh, not to make it boring, but to give yourself chance to pay more attention. My thumb goes up, and that uh, that uh, helps to reach uh, uh, to, to reach higher notes. Uh, in many videos uh, concerning uh, higher positions, I'm talk about uh, I, I talk about uh, about uh, moving the thumb. So at some point, when you go beyond the fourth position, your thumb is starting to move up and that's really uh, really Im important and then you just put it on the string here uh, this way you're preparing yourself uh, to uh, to master the skill of actually using it in the higher positions but but at first you just have to put it somewhere next to the first finger uh, making sure that you are not keeping your thumb like this or let alone not uh, keeping it in a regional position no matter how high you uh, you want to go Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. And uh, yes. Yeah, so when we uh, when we have to play uh, lone pieces, uh, it's naturally uh, more strain on our uh, our bodies. And some of that it's perfectly normal. So you have to be ready. You play longer piece. And by longer piece, uh, it might be uh, just going from one minute piece to two minutes piece, uh, or later on to ten. And you know some of the cello concerti, for instance. Um, Shostakovich second concerto I played few years ago. It's 40 plus minutes uh, long. So you really have to prepare yourself, uh, not only mentally, but physically to run this marathon. And you know, uh, to run marathon, you don't have to have huge muscles. Uh, it's more about preparing your whole, bo whole body and uh, learning how your muscles are working in the most efficient way. At any rate, uh, let's uh, let's now play uh, D major scale two notes per bow, and uh, I will be still using the whole bow, and uh, I will be splitting the, uh, each uh, bow, of course, to uh, two parts uh, to uh, make sure that I have enough bow uh, for every note, and try to avoid mistake of spending uh, more than a half of the bow uh, playing the first note and having very little bow. Uh, to play the second note. So uh, be mindful and it's always the better, uh, better idea uh, to spend less bow for the first note and then more for the second uh, rather than uh, opposite way. Let's do it. Uh, D major scale, three octaves, uh, two notes per bow. If you can uh, play with me, please, uh, please d do that or you can try to do it later after you watched it.
Remember that uh, the key uh, to get consistent sound uh, on all four strings is to pay attention to the angle of the bow. Right, so, uh, so especially when we play in the lower strings, we tend to forget about this. Uh, and we just prepare the bow in a generic way. We just put it uh, like this and hopefully this angle will be good uh, for D and A string. That means you are turning the bow, uh, you know, this way, slightly away from yourself. But then, uh, but then we do the same uh, playing on the C string. And uh, as a result, we get squeaky, fuzzy a sound like this. And uh, that makes us to try to avoid playing on the lower strings. And that's a, a big mistake, mistake, mistake uh, because uh, the low strings uh, is something really special, uh, what you can show uh, playing cello. Uh, and uh, many uh, wonderful uh, cello pieces, uh, they have a big part that you play on the low string. Uh, e minor sonata and then uh, so we are beginning of uh, Prokofiev uh, cello sonata uh, and uh, there are many uh, other other examples of that so uh, so be mindful about that okay now we uh, will uh, continue with the second part of the lesson, uh, staccato. I got a uh, number of requests uh, to, uh, to start working on this bow stroke. Uh, most likely at some point I'll just make a standalone uh, video uh, about, about this, but now it will be my first uh, take uh, on explaining it uh, to, uh, to you. By the way, if you feel like, uh, don't forget to just, you know, say hi and, uh, and introduce yourself, regardless if, you, uh, if you're here every week or it's the very first time you're here. Uh, remember, that gives everyone a sense of community, a sense of belonging, and that's so important, especially in uh, our modern times when uh, sometimes we have to hunker down in, uh, in our uh, houses. So more we communicate with each other, not just, uh, uh, just between me and uh, each of you, but between yourself, uh, the uh, better we feel and more inspired we will be uh, to, uh, to play cello. Okay, uh, so uh, staccato. Uh, that's very confusing bow stroke, even starting with its name. Uh, if you play piano, uh, that uh, definition of staccato is that uh, you uh, you play you play each note very short, so there is a very quick uh, articulation, very quick attack, and uh, there is always a space uh, gap between uh, between notes. So you see a dot above the note, and you uh, think staccato. Now, for the string instrument. It's slightly different because uh, we actually uh, can achieve a fairly similar result, at least at the, at the beginning, uh, with a different bow stroke, uh, spiccato. And, uh, uh, and uh, this, is uh, this is why I would, first of all, encourage you to think uh, spiccato if you uh, see in your music a uh, bunch of, the, say, 16th notes. They are not connected, but they just have dots. That means that, uh, that you would play them uh, this way. For instance, I'll play uh, part of, the, of this uh, D major scale. So uh, every note is um, is a different bow direction. Uh, you uh, you lift the bow, 
and uh, and uh, that's uh, that's it uh, for for spiccato. Uh, now, uh, when you play when you play staccato, first of all you have to see a slur. So staccato for string instrument, uh, you see the long slur uh, and uh, and dot above the each note. So slur and uh, and dots. Now. 99% of the of the uh, when we have to play staccato you do it up bow and uh, and I will talk a little bit later why is that so uh, for now I will show you uh, sh show this bow stroke staccato so I'm starting up bow and uh, <laughs> it works uh it works more or less uh, like uh, like that it could be it it could uh work in a slower tempo or uh or in a faster tempo now uh now if you think about that and to listen carefully you actually will notice that uh, that when we play staccato, we are uh, we are not making each note extremely short. It has uh, it still has some length. So uh, so I like to think about each note is with a uh, with a line, but then there is a time between notes. So uh, so to me the most precise way uh, to mark staccato notes would be line and the dot and of course all of staccato notes uh, would be uh, would be connected to the slur so that would look really confusing but uh, let's uh, let's have the first uh, first approach to that so uh, if it's your first uh, time playing uh, playing staccato we could choose a comfortable uh, string uh, this string would work uh, just uh, the best, and uh, play the part of uh, of D major scale starting mm. from G down to D. So just four notes. And again, you uh, you put it closer to the tip, and you see what I'm doing. That's the way I like you to uh, to think about uh, about that. So a low note with the stop. Now, why staccato is usually done up bow? Uh, here, the way bow is uh, designed comes to play. Uh, it really helps when you start in the lighter part of the bow and then you move towards the. Uh, heavier part of the bow which is uh, which of course this lower part of the uh, of the bow this way naturally bow helps uh, physics actually helped uh, bow to stay on the string you don't want a bow to jump off the string that uh, that's a different bow stroke uh, so it's even more advanced and rarely, uh, rarely used. Uh, so I, I would uh, not try to do it right away because then you just, uh, uh, you just uh, lose control. You, you, uh, you know, like think this way. You just uh, get a new driving license and you get to drive a sport car. Well, uh, well, it's much higher chances that things will not go well. So, so the same thing, you have to uh, try to keep the bow on the string. Now, in the upper part of the bow, uh, even when you play normal bow stroke legata, you turn the wrist and, uh, and your fingers uh, move to this position. Right, so we, uh, we constantly have it back and forth. Uh, think, uh, think this way on the open string. <laughs> Now I'm uh, here in the upper part of the bow. Uh, my uh, wrist is somewhat tilted to the index finger, and that's 
how I start uh, staccato ball stroke. Now, uh, your fingers are tilted this way. That means that uh, weight uh, is shifting towards the index finger. So your pinky is actually uh, not really in use. And uh, this is why you see, say, violinists uh, playing, uh, playing, especially in a higher uh, position, and you see that, uh, that uh, uh, their pinky is uh, not even uh, touching most of the time. And uh, what I meant by higher position in the upper part of the bow when uh, violinists are, are, are playing. So here we use the same, uh, the same technique. Uh, your, uh, you turn your wrist this way, your index finger is in extremely active, uh, active position, and uh, you start playing. <laughs> For people who just are uh, joining us, uh, we are done with uh, warming up uh, playing D major scale and we continue uh, working on staccato. Uh, this bow stroke, it's more advanced bow stroke, but it's never too early uh, to try it. Uh, now, uh, now, when you, uh, when you play again, uh, make sure that actually you, uh, your bow is on the string. That's another reason why we start staccato in the upper part of the bow. Uh, it's way harder to lift the bow after each note when you're in the upper uh, half of the bow. And that helps to maintain very good control. If you uh, notice that your bow starts bouncing off the string when you play staccato, uh, most likely this is the a sign that you are losing control. And uh, I would encourage you, uh, after you play uh, scale, any scale, uh, scale you like, especially the scale which you feel it's fairly easy to play for you, then, uh, then uh, try to play it uh, uh, staccato, even few notes. It's a bit easier when you go down, when you move uh, from, uh, from a higher string to lower. Because again, we go into the lower part of the bow and, uh, and when, we, uh, when your elbow goes down, it also helps a lot to feel that you are more grounded on the string. And each note, uh, staccato, uh, has to be on the string. Then quick stop, and then you continue next uh, next note. A uh, very common mistake is try to play fast, uh, so you uh, you uh, you making your uh, your wrist and uh, hand very tense, and you achieve something like. <laughs> Where uh, besides a uh, uh, way of scratcher sound, uh, you have no control or very little control of, of the tempo. And of course, you, if you listen, uh, you, if you listen, uh, you know, some, uh, somebody playing uh, faster passages, you might get impression, well, uh, that's how uh, how the bow works when people play uh, staccato, but actually that's quite uh, quite opposite. Okay, uh, okay, and uh, let me just play uh, the top part of this uh, D major scale we worked on. Actually, I will start just from D on the A string, and uh, I will play in a slower tempo, and that's how I would recommend you uh, to try it. Each note should be done with the separate motion of your wrist. You will be learning it uh, to, uh, to, to do it faster, 
and by the way uh, by, by the way you see we uh, of course we can move our fingers our wrist way faster than uh, than elbow let alone uh, you know shoulder so uh, so if uh, if you start uh, playing and you just move your uh, your arm with the, with the ball uh, you will never be able to do it fast so that's always a uh, kind of finer technique uh, when you have to play faster it's done with the smaller parts of your arm so now uh, so at to the point it just merely you control it with uh, I feel like just tips of uh, fingers so, so very precise surgical uh, motion rather than just one broad uh, motion of your right arm uh, like kind of how we would use a shovel uh, so, so that's that's quite uh, quite uh, different okay uh, okay so I think uh, that's a good uh, time we spent just with our first approach uh, to staccato and now let's uh, let's continue with uh, prelude G major prelude from uh, first suite by uh, Johann Sebastian Bach uh, we will start uh, where we stopped uh, last time uh, it's roughly a second page uh, you remember uh, my recommendation if it's possible for you to get a copy of uh, German edition like Baron Reiter or Handley uh, then uh, then that's a little bit more expensive uh, but uh, but this book you will keep uh, you know as long as you play cello and uh, and uh, it will suggest will provide you with the best fingerings and uh, bowings at any rate uh, I will start uh, from measure 21 here uh, we reached uh, we, we reached a special part of this prelude where uh, the music uh, seems just to stop and uh, that's really important to know how to uh, how to do that so uh, so right before fermata you have to make sure that you have enough bow to to play this uh, this lone uh, D you might uh, use a uh, uh, bow in uh, it will be just uh, somewhat harder to save the bow but at any rate uh, you have to be ready to spend more bow uh, playing this D because uh, then you uh, you most likely would choose uh, to make very big diminuendo and uh, that seems to be that just the music here uh, ceases to exist right so you just disappear and that's a very special effect because right after that <laughs> After that, uh, most of the uh, cellists uh, uh, try uh, to to keep a bow in the upper part of the bow. Why? Uh, that's very clear uh, part where you can uh, control the bow uh, well, and it will help you to play uh, softly. And that's exactly what uh, uh, what uh, it seems to be appropriate uh, here. And uh, remember, uh, with bowings, uh, you can actually start exploring this uh, this prelude just uh, playing most of the notes one note per bow, and then uh, and and then uh, you can follow the addition, uh, and uh, you can even uh, change uh, bowing uh, somewhat. So okay, I'll uh, I'll start again from uh, measure twenty two, and we will go uh, beyond that.
Now, in a measure 26, uh, there are different uh, ideas in some editions of which even which notes to play. So, uh, so in some editions, uh, after C sharp, uh, it's uh, printed to play uh, B flat right away. <laughs> In uh, Baron Reiter edition, uh, I have uh, here in measure 26, uh, the third beat, uh, first you play uh, B natural. Remember, no original survived, at least was found yet. Uh, so, uh, so all uh, copies uh, we have, handwritten copies, uh, don't belong to Johann Sebastian Bach. Uh, so, uh, so, so the most famous uh, uh, copy is uh, Anna Magdalena Bach, uh, uh, his wife, uh, who made this this copy. And uh, with all um, you know uh, cases when people had to copy by hand, uh, mistakes were made. And sometimes uh, uh, people still debating, uh, musicologists are debating, uh, was it uh, just a mistake or actually that was original intention by composer? And, uh, and uh, you might agree with one way or another, and, that, and that's beauty of music. Uh, so you follow, uh, you follow your uh, you know, ad addition you agree with. So uh, at any rate, remember, uh, remember the idea I suggested uh, working on this uh, uh, prelude uh, a week ago, that you need to find uh, the way to show polyphony, to show the second voice. Because the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, it's all about several voices uh, coexisting at the same time. And with cello, we uh, have very limited resources to show those voices, uh, in, uh, you know, at the same time. Uh, but say some other instruments are well better designed to do that, uh, notably piano, organ, and uh, violin to some extent too. And of course, uh, in an orchestra, you can uh, you can uh, you, you can compose in such a way that you can have. Uh, as many voices as you want uh, going at the same time. So, so uh, how you uh, present it here, you uh, want to show some uh, bass notes or sometimes some, uh, some higher notes with a little bit more time and a little bit more vibrato. For instance, uh, to me, it, may, it would make sense to linger at least slightly on the downbeat of measure 24 and then uh, down a bit, uh, down bit of 25. Let me show you uh, it, uh, like uh, how I feel about uh, about this. And this time I will exaggerate. So I'll play all those more important notes on way slower. So I'll start uh, right after fermata note, uh, measure uh, second part of the measure 22. <laughs> And of course, doing it this way uh, would just uh, destroy uh, the flow of this music. So that, uh, to me, it sounded like a completely different piece. But on the other hand, uh, if you don't do anything like the, anything like this, at least a little bit, that will just uh, sound uh, sound like uh, uh, like uh, uh, like an etude itself. If you don't uh, if you don't uh, show anything, if you play it absolutely even. That uh, that will sound uh, like this. You know, it might.
might uh, make a music teacher happy it might uh, it might help uh, to pass the test you know proficiency test but that will not be definitely any uh, valuable interpretation uh, something what uh, what audience uh, might be uh, might be uh, affected um, affected uh, with that and uh, uh, and still uh, let me uh, let me post this uh, this site you could uh, you could uh, search for uh, for free uh, copy again it will not be uh, will not be uh, Baron writer uh, or Henley edition but it will uh, it will uh, will be good uh, starting uh, starting point if you uh, cannot get uh, get your copy of Bach's uh, music uh, right away okay uh, uh, okay so now we made it up to measure 29 and uh, and here uh, seems to be that uh, this D it's another important uh, in point where you can actually slow down and uh, linger a little a little bit and uh, reflect because after that uh, the flow of music is changing uh, those descending scales they get uh, longer they go lower it's uh, I think the way for Bach to prepare us uh, to uh, to show us transition to the next part of this prelude so that would be <laughs> After that, uh, that's uh, probably the trickiest, uh, trickiest part of uh, of, of this uh, this prelude. Uh, you uh, you go uh, from one string to another, and uh, and uh, if you don't pay attention to fingerings, you might end up uh, just uh, just play it in uh, in in uh, incorrect uh, way. And uh, it's very important, starting from measure 31, uh, second part, um, uh, second part, uh, second beat rather, uh, just to understand that uh, that moving voice, which is uh, each group of four, note number one and three, you play on the D string, and then uh, and then when you uh, have a, which is usually not number two, not number four of each group. That's open A string. Uh, and another thing, traditionally, no matter which bowing you have, uh, you have before that, uh, you uh, you want to play those moving notes, notes number one and three of every group, up bow. <laughs> Also try to uh, to play in the upper part of the bow, and that might uh, seem to be strange, uh, but uh, this way uh, you actually will be able uh, to show two voices. So here, uh, here that's a rare case where uh, we can actually, even with cello, show real polyphony. Never mind that the second voice is the open string. It's uh, it's uh, and it's not moving. It stays the same way. But uh, but it provides uh, extra dimension. One voice uh, stays and another is moving. So relation between this moving voice and uh, and this uh, repeated a uh, is uh, changing uh, note by note. Uh, let me show you. Uh, let me show you uh, what could be your goal. Uh, goal. So I'll play uh, right from uh, measure 31, and I'll play in a faster tempo. <laughs> Uh, 
faster after that. So, uh, so if you listen in a faster tempo, uh, then uh, then it's way more clear uh, to uh, to hear this uh, this moving voice. But you also notice that uh, that I did a lot uh, a lot of this kind of motion with uh, with the wrist, which um, which is uh, is uh, really imp important. So. Uh, so so uh, that moving voice, that uh, note number one and note number three of each group, uh, you know, four sixteenth sixteenth uh, notes, is on the D string, and uh, and be careful of using uh, fingerings, uh, correct fingerings. It should bring you to the higher position on the D string. This uh, this is why this uh, suite this prelude seems to be uh, relatively uh, easy uh, at the beginning playing the first uh, page not easy but uh, but say after uh, you know maybe a year or even sometimes less uh, experience playing cello depends how you know how you move how much uh, work you put into that you can approach it but then uh, but then this part it's really frust frustrating so uh, so if you can start exploring it now if it's too difficult uh, don't get uh, frustrated just put it aside maybe enjoy working on uh, on the first page and get back to that when you are uh, fairly confident uh, going to the uh, higher positions but now let me play those uh, few lines for you in a slower tempo and just pay attention uh, what I'm doing with my left hand and, uh, and also that uh, that every uh, note is on a different string. So uh, I'll start from the uh, measure uh, 31. <laughs> Uh, some sense uh, to you. Uh, now, uh, just uh, one more point. Uh, the most confusing uh, parts is uh, uh, parts are here when you have several A's. They are the same, the top line, but uh, but you have uh, stem some of the notes down and some of the notes uh, notes up. Again, all uh, if in your edition, uh, in like most editions, uh, you have some of the notes, uh, this A uh, stem up, there are open string. And uh, A's with the stem down are on a D string. For instance, measure 33, uh, starting from the third beat, it's... <laughs> It's very rarely when uh, we have to deal with that, so uh, so uh, that will take way more time to get it right than it uh, usually uh, happens with just a few sixteenth uh, sixteenth notes. Uh, now, uh, last three lines, uh, starting from uh, measure uh, thirty-seven, uh, we uh, we have slightly different texture, so uh, so that will be. Uh, from 37 
and here I like to change the bowing. So remember, uh, I mentioned that uh, starting from measure 31, the second beat from measure 31, I would suggest to start each group of uh, four notes up bow. So that's always like you play on the uh, D string, uh, that note is up, and then a uh, note or open A string, uh, A is down, and then you end up playing. <laughs> Uh, in a measure uh, 37 uh, then you uh, you get back to more standard uh, bowings which means uh, which means you have to slur uh, two notes and uh, that uh, usually happens uh, second eighth note of the measure 37 so D and E uh, slurred and then you play you go to the higher position but we more get used to do it on the A string so I hope it will be somewhat easier for you uh, for you to get it right also uh, make sure that you pay attention uh, to this uh, chromatic uh, upward uh, uh, movement so right uh, right away uh, distance between every note when you go higher and higher it's just a half a step so this way we are basically have to play a uh, chromatic scale. Uh, if you would leave out this uh, repeated, uh, repeated D, you will get This uh, is the way I would actually recommend uh, re recommend you uh, studying it right before uh, before you you play on two strings. And uh, by the way, uh, that's the same way you could do even starting from measure 30, uh, 31. You can uh, leave out uh, this repeated A note, skip it, and uh, just play all odd notes a uh, note number one and three uh, of uh, every group so starting from the second beat of measure 31 it would uh, work uh <laughs> That would uh, would actually help a lot uh, to uh, to be able uh, to hear this moving voice and uh, and get uh, used to that. And uh, and the last part uh, this uh, this climax of this uh, prelude. Uh, let me uh, let me show you. Uh, there are a couple of different uh, different uh, options for fingerings. So I'll play in a slightly harder way for you. Uh, what is harder here is that uh, that you uh, you have to play this uh, D on the G string. It seemed to uh, sound better, but you know, uh, might be different uh, different opinions of, uh, about that. So alternative fingering uh, would be starting from measure 39, uh, last two lines, last uh, last four measures of the of the prelude uh, to play open D, and uh, let me play it for you uh, slightly slower. It will work this way. So you see 
here are uh, you just uh, lifting uh, uh, you know finger on the D string and then you'll get uh, you get uh, open uh, open D so so that might be a viable alternative uh, to uh, this finger and because uh, if you decide not to play open D then I uh, just much harder in measure four <laughs> need to get some experience barring uh, two strings at a time uh, to get the perfect fifth. Again, it's worth it. That uh, would be my choice of fingerings to perform, but I, I know that it's much, uh, much harder to do. Uh, so, uh, and uh, and uh, this is uh, where uh, very active usu usually uh you know part of the of the prelude you have to make sure that especially if you if you go from string to string from a to d to g that you adjusting uh adjusting the bow angle and you do <laughs> that you uh, you change the angle so uh, the note on the G string get a chance to uh, to be uh, played with uh, with the clarity and the last uh, note of the chord uh, what you do you have to make sure that you uh, you save the bow when you When you play the first part of the chord, uh, you use way less bow, and uh, and that will really uh, will really help you to make the chord way longer and uh, gracefully disappeared with the last note. Now we are almost at the end of the lesson. To conclude it, uh, why don't I play through this uh, this uh, suite and? Uh, Actually, just a prelude, of course, uh, and uh, and that's interesting uh, for me. Remember, I was talking about challenges. So, uh, so playing uh, playing in the morning, uh, that's a least uh, a least desired time to perform, but that's the challenge we have to overcome. And uh, and I would rather present myself when I warmed up. Uh, but why don't we do it now? And I'm sure I will learn something. Uh, and uh, and you'll get a ch uh, chance to hear it uh, well a live version of this uh, of this prelude and uh, I will play uh, I will play mostly uh, one note per bow uh, combining it with uh, with few other bowings and uh, don't worry you don't have to play exactly with the same bowings uh, the point is uh, just to make sure that uh, that you allow yourself to uh, to experiment and uh, and that's uh, that's always important when you are practicing let's do it
Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for staying, uh, staying with me. Uh, say I just played for you, and of course that's uh, far from idea. That would be just a starting point for uh, for, for for the day. But uh, you know what? Uh, we uh, musicians we shouldn't be afraid of exposing ourselves and uh, and making uh, some mistakes, or at least uh, to extend that we feel it's not perfect but that should just give us uh, inspiration and urge uh, to work more, try to achieve higher and higher level. So, uh, so thank, you, thank you for spending time with me. I hope you learned something new and we'll have our next uh, live stream uh, session uh, next, uh, next Tuesday. And by the way, if, uh, if you're interested to learn about some problems with hands uh, and our body uh, uh, t when you play cello and uh, hopefully to prevent those problems to occur, uh, you know, check out our latest video on Cellopedia. And uh, if, you, uh, if you have something to share, always please don't hesitate uh, to write a comment that will help uh, me. Uh, and uh, that will help all other cellists to hear your perspective. Anyway, uh, thank you. Thank you again. See you next week. Bye-bye.